Pray with me, please. Lord Jesus, please be here with us right now in this session. Show us what you want us to learn, Lord. Teach us, guide us, draw us into your presence. Show us areas that need change, Lord. But most of all, Father, show us how much you love us. In Jesus' name, amen. So they asked for a title, and I came up with Godly Thoughts, Godly Life, and then I just looked at it and up there, well, that, I don't even know where I came up with that. That sounds very, almost impossible. Um, because I think that controlling our thoughts and making our minds mind us is such a difficult thing. But how important it is that you and I have this disciplined mind. Would you turn once again to Philippians, the fourth chapter, and you've heard this before, but I'm going to read it to you again, starting in verse, oh, it would be good if I wasn't in Colossians, starting in verse 8. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there be any virtue and if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. Paul now in this, these verses addresses a subject that is so important. As Jeanette showed us this morning, he's already told us to be firm, to be united, to be rejoicing, to be gentle, to be not anxious, to be praying. And now he tells us, I want you to be thinking of these things. If right now, through some supernatural ability, I could, up on these screens, put what each one of you is thinking. Oh, yes. <laughs> My dad always used to say to me when I was a little girl, penny for your thoughts. And then before I answered, I would try to think of something really wonderful that I could say I was thinking when I probably wasn't. Like when I was driving up here, when I was supposed to be thinking about all these things from these verses, I was thinking about what a terrible bad hair day I was having. <laughs> you know, it looked good when I left the house, but then when I looked in the rearview mirror, it just looked horrible. And it was consuming me as I was driving. I had to really be careful and centered and think again and bring these things back to my remembrance and choose to think on them. What we think is so important. Sometimes I'll say to my husband, what, what were you thinking? That's a whole different subject, but sometimes I'll just say to him, what are you thinking? I want to know what's in there. I want to know uh, what, what he's dwelling on, what he's contemplating. He still fascinates me after all these years. But there was one time when I asked him what he was thinking when I was sorry I did, and I, I'm just going to tell this to kind of wake you up because Jean and I were on this trip together that my husband had planned with all our best friends, and we went river rafting on the Tuolumne River. And um, it, they, I don't know if you've ever been ri river rafting, but it was a class five rapids, which nobody's supposed to be on. We were the first run of the season. We were the last run of the season because it was so treacherous, and we we ran into trouble. It was a three-day trip, like on the second um, second day. Many of our rafts went over. I went over. I um, I, I saw my husband go over. I, I hit the bottom of the, the rocks. I kept coming up. I couldn't catch my breath. I couldn't seem to, you have no idea where you are. It's like being in a washing machine. And, um, and I really thought I was going to die. And I kept, I kept, I went down for what I thought was the very last time. And when I came back up and took this big breath, I looked over and there was my husband. And our, our guide had him spread out on a rock. He was pumping the water out of his out of his lungs, and I thought, we are, we are in trouble. Then I went down again, and finally I came up one last time, and a raft was able to get to me and pull me in. Um, but, but later when we all, and it was traumatic, and your life doesn't pass in front of you when you think you're drowning, just in case you wanted to know. Um, <laughs> So we finally got all the rafts to a place where we could get out and we could all assess the damages and we could, you know, make sure that everybody was safe. And so I found my husband and I said, oh, I said, I was so afraid that you weren't going to make it. I saw you go off. I saw him pumping the water out of you. I kept going up and down and up and down and I thought I was going to die and, and never see you again. And, and I looked at him and I said these words, what were you thinking that when you really thought it was 
your last breath. And he looked at me in complete sincerity, just very impromptu, and he said, I was just thinking, here I come, Jesus. Aw. So... <laughs> And I knew I was in trouble when he looked at me and he said, what were you thinking? <laughs> and I knew I had to be honest because I'd almost died. So I didn't want God again to try and take my life. So I said, well, you know, you know, last night when there were two desserts and I only had one, <laughs> I was thinking I should have had them both because it really doesn't matter now. But my mind is personally my greatest, my hardest, my most continual battle. My brain, my thoughts, I worry, I wonder about things, I overthink everything, I try to fix everybody. I was thinking the other morning with no sleep, I wonder if my kids really cared that I was up half the night <laughs> trying to fix all their problems. And, 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 and I worry. I'm a, I'm a worrier. I, anybody else a worrier? I'm a worrier unlike any worrier you have ever seen. I'm a world-class worrier. If there were a worrying Olympics, I would win every event <laughs> that there was. In fact, you worriers, if you're tired of worrying about something, just give it to me and I will worry about it <laughs> for you. In my head, in my thinking process, I even have conversations. I replay conversations that I have already had with people replaying them in my mind about the way they should have gone. Anybody else do that? Y yes, and aren't you always brilliant in those replays and wise and solid and authoritative? Um, I do that too. I can get anxious and worrisome and full of anxiety. I have a terrible time turning off my head at night. Anybody else, I get into bed and I think, oh, I'm so tired, I can't wait to go to sleep, and then and, and, and it just starts and it, and it won't stop. Pardon me? Oh yes, and I'm still awake and I still have solved nothing, and it's still going around. Kay Smith told me something, those of you who do this also, um, told me something years and years ago when I was telling her how difficult it was for me to fall asleep. She said, take the alphabet, begin with A, work your way all the way down, and ascribe one quality of God to each letter. And so I will do that. He is all-knowing. He is beautiful. He is Christ my Lord. He is divine. He is my friend. He is holy. And that just like switches me over into a time when I can just concentrate on him and I will feel all my fears and worries let go. I also have to be very careful of what I read or what I watch on TV or listen to. It's like I'm a re I record everything and then I play it back. I have to discipline my mind and my thoughts. And that's why this passage in Philippians is so meaningful and important to me and can be so use useful to you and I of dealing with this. Why is this area so important, our minds and our thoughts? <clears throat> Let me give you four reasons that I see. First of all, it says in scripture, Proverbs 23, 7, as a man thinks, so he is. So I am actually becoming what I think about. So what do you think about most of the time? What's your first thought in the morning? Mine's coffee. I know it should be Jesus, but it just is coffee. <laughs> or what's your last thought before you go to bed tonight? You are becoming what you think about. Your thoughts will eventually work their way out of your head, into your actions, and into your life. That's one reason. Second reason that I see is that sin begins in our minds in our thought process. Evil thoughts come to us in our heads. Lucifer, his sin began in his head. It was the sin of pride. Eve, her sin began thinking, thinking, thinking that maybe God hadn't really said what he meant and hadn't really meant what he said. 
Our heads can be a reason for us to sin. So we can't even allow or entertain thoughts like that because once they're in there, then there's a possibility that we will then commit them. In our heads where no one can see or hear, it can be a dangerous place. Sin can begin there. And I'm always very sobered by the fact that you may not be able to see my thoughts, but God can. The third reason is the mind is a battleground. It is a battleground. The world and its systems continually bombard us. Television, Hollywood, the internet, social media, magazine, books, politics, just bombard us with their philosophies. We need to make our minds protected. We need to build, you know, if there were ever time to build the wall, this is the place where the wall should be built. It should be built in protection around our minds. We leave them unprotected. We leave them vulnerable to the control and the work and the words of the enemy. We need to be very, very careful that we do not entertain ourselves with the very things that Jesus died for. We need to be very, very careful that we do not let in the things of the world, that we protect our mind. Be careful. Be protective of your brain, of your thought. In this day, a time of internet and the social media, we have immediate information at just a click or a swipe of our phones. Good news, bad news, fake news comes in comes in the gateway of our eyes into our minds where it can stay and replay. I am constantly cleaning out, clearing out, washing out my brain, my head, my thoughts. The devil battles for our minds, but so does our humanity and our human nature and our flesh. You and I both still are flesh and spirit, and whatever gets in your mind, gets you. If your mind is feeding on the things of the flesh, then the things of the spirit will become less and less and less. This is our job to protect our thoughts. No one else can do it for us. The fourth reason is that we can have strongholds in our minds. I've mentioned some of mine, worry, anxiety, fear, even guilt, jealousy, resentment, Bible says, tear them down, take them captive, control them. We have this divine power. We have weapons, it's if Paul said in 2 Corinthians, to destroy the strongholds. We destroy arguments and every opinion raised against the knowledge of God and we take every thought into captivity. We can be in control. We have all that we need in order to control our thoughts. If you feel like you're spiraling out of control, see and recognize and go after these thoughts and pull them and grab them into captivity. Reign in your thoughts, capture them. We can demolish arguments. We can take down every stronghold and most strongholds, at least in my life, are in my head. And now finally, I know I'm saying that because that's what Paul said, and I know finally I am now to the verses. But I wanted you to see how important, how vital your thoughts are are, and how dangerous it is not to protect them and control your thought life. Paul tells us now to think on these things. He gives us this lovely, beautiful list of what our thoughts should be. We choose to think to dwell, to reside, to settle down in this list that Paul gives us. And the first thing he says is where it all begins, think on whatever is true. Whatever is true. It begins with the truth in my head. God's word is true. I need to steep myself in God's word. Jesus himself is true. He says, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. 
It always begins there with me being a woman who fills my brain, my thoughts with the truths of God. In this time, in this country, in this world, you need to know what God says because only God's word is true. You need to be a woman who finds a way, morning, noon, night, to be in God's word. You need to ask God to give you a hunger and thirst for it like you've never had before. It begins with the truth. The second thing is the noble, or the honorable. There is only one that I can think of who is noble and honorable, and that is my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I think about him how beyond compare he was, how honorable he is. And then there's also the next one, just. Think about those things that are just. When I think about those things that are just, I cannot think of anything else but my Savior who justified me. Because there's no, nothing in me that makes me worthy of anything other than his work on the cross for me. When I start going through this list and I think of what is true and honorable, and then I want to think about the one who justified me. I like to think about that day that he accomplished that for me. I like to make my thoughts go to what he paid. I want to make my mind consider the cost of his sacrifice. That I am justified by him and by nothing else. Sometimes in my head, I replay this little video that I've been playing since I got saved of the day when I finally stand before God the Father. And whenever I replay it in my mind, it always makes me just a little nervous that I'm going to be there. And, and, and he's going to be so amazingly beautiful and holy, and I'm going to be just standing there so unworthy of even getting in and I, and I used to think, I think there's a really strong possibility that he's going to take one look at me, all revealed, all my life, all my mistakes, all my sins, all my thoughts, and he's not going to let me in. It used to just haunt me. And then one day that was playing in my mind and into my thought process. I had this amazing, unbelievable, beautiful vision. I'm standing there. God's standing there. He's looking at me. I'm thinking that there's no way, and then Jesus walks up right beside me, and he puts his arms around me, and he looks at God the Father, and he says, take her. Take her. She's mine. That's all I needed to be justified. I like to think about that. I like to be grateful for that. I like to fill my thoughts with the beautiful thing that he did for me, that he reached down into the miry pit that was my life, and he picked me up and he gave me a place to stand. I love to think about that. The next one is pure. Paul warns us not to let any immorality or impurity be named among us, but there also can be no immorality or no impurity in our thought process, in our lives. And we live in an increasingly immoral, evil world. I have never felt so out of touch, so out of sync with the world as I do the last couple of years. There is an evil, there is a darkness. Do you see it? Do you sense it? Of which I have never seen or experienced in my life. But not only do I look at the world and see that, lately I've also been seeing an immorality and an impurity and a liberty in the church itself. My morals, my values seem completely out of date. Within the church, not this church, not my church, there is a liberal attitude, a lack of purity, a turning away from morality, I see, sadly, a desire to see how much they can get away with, how much can be added to their Christian doctrines and beliefs 
and behavior and still call themselves Christians. And trust me, this is a dangerous, slippery slope. It leads nowhere, destroys our witness, it defeats our victories. We need to rise above what we see going on. And I know I'm old and you're probably looking at me and saying, yeah, she's old. But, <laughs> but this has nothing to do with my age. But at this point in my life, which has been the point in my laugh, life for the last almost 50 years, I'm not looking for anything that I can add. I'm not looking for anything that will make me cool, cooler or hipper or more modern or more relevant. In fact, I'm asking God to take away, strip away from me anything and everything that does not honor him or please him. I want it all out. I want to be pure. I want to be pure like a, like a little baby, freshly cleansed, washed, and tucked into bed. I want that in my life. And that requires that I have a very sensitive attitude to sin. It requires that I don't allow my thought process to make excuses for my sin or to give me reasons to get away with it. It requires me being willing to allow God to look and see and cleanse me. I love repentance. I love the feeling of repentance. I love the availability of repentance. This is the greatest deal that there ever was. We sin, we ask God for forgiveness, and he not only forgives immediately, he forgets forever. What a deal is that? Why do we hold on to those things that we know don't please him? Even the little sins, even the, what Amy Carmichael says, the silken sins. When this cleansing, this purity is so easily and readily available for us. The Bible says that God's mercy is new every morning. And I think of it as a, like a muffin, like a mercy muffin. And I wake up every morning hungry for God's mercy. Did you ever read that quote by that, that woman who's that little prayer that she said, um, Lord, so far, I'm, I'm, I'm doing really well. I haven't had any anger thoughts. I haven't yelled at my husband. I haven't kicked the dog. But pretty soon I'm going to have to get out of bed. And doesn't it happen just that quickly? where I need God's forgiveness. The fifth thing is that Paul mentions is to think on whatever is lovely. That word means attractive, pleasing. What are the lovely things about Jesus? What attracted me to him? What is so pleasing about him? I think on those things. The sixth one is whatever is of good report. I love this because thinking on the things of good report lets me, causes me to let go of the things that I am worried about, causes me to think about and concentrate on all the things of good report that God has done for me over the years, never once failed, was never once late, even though it looked like he was going to be. He has been so amazing. I need to think on those things because those are the things of good report. I love Lamentation's work. He's crying out and he says, my soul is bereft of peace. I have forgotten what happiness is. My endurance has perished. So has my hope from the Lord. And then he does this. But this I call to mind. And he calls to mind the things of good report. And this is what he calls to mind, the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. There they are. Great is his faithfulness. And then he writes, and therefore I have hope. Think on the things of good report. I love to even write them down. Make a list. Keep a journal. Get it out on paper, the things that God has done for me. I love Psalm 51. David's crying out. 
He says, hear my cry, O oh Lord, attend unto my prayer. From the ends of the earth, I'm crying out to you. And then he prays, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. In David's thought, he, thoughts, he is be almost beyond help, beyond being reached. He's crying out to the Lord. He's gone from the ends of the earth, and now he is so low. He's asking God to come in and lift him up to the rock of Jesus Christ. But then I love it, after this cry for God's mercy, then he does just what Paul's telling us to do. He says, for you have been. Now he's going to switch over from whatever it is he's worried about, whatever, and it was bad at that point in time in, in David's life, whatever it is he's fearful of. And he's going to think about those things of good report. For you have been, he says, a shelter, a strong tower. Think on, fill your mind with all the wonderful things that God has done for you. His mercy, his grace, his power, his coming again. I love to think about his coming again. I think it's going to be really soon that he's going to come again. And if he's not coming again soon, I know that now that I'm old, it gets sooner every day that I'm going to go to where he is. So I'm, I'm either, either going to come back with him or I'm going to be, go up with him when he comes. I'm not sure, but either way... That is the most amazing thought to me, that my God, and, and, I, and I love this, you know what, he's not coming as a helpless babe in the manger. He's coming as the roaring lion of Judah. He's coming in all his beauty and all his glory and all his justice and all his purity and all his loveliness. I like to think about that. That is a thing of good report to me. I like to think about all the times he's helped me and healed me, all the times he's held me, all the times he's forgiven me, things of good report. Think on these things, Paul says. What a menu for you and I. Write them down, memorize them, true, honorable, just, pure, lovely, good report, and then you choose those things. You choose those things to think about. What a rich reservoir of thoughts that he gives us, that we can choose, that we can concentrate on. And then he says, if there be any virtue, if there be anything praiseworthy, is Jesus not the most virtuous one? Is he not worthy of our praise? Then think of him. Fill your thoughts with him. Whatever is true, right, pure, lovely, Jesus, he is the truth. Jesus, he is just. Jesus, he is honorable. Jesus, he is the only pure one. Jesus, he is lovely. Think on thing, those things. Fill your mind. You and I need a renewed mind. It's a promise of our salvation that Jesus would renew our mind, that it would be controlled. And in order to be controlled, it has to be full of God's word and God's Holy Spirit. It requires what Romans 12 says, it requires that we live a surrendered and a sacrificial life. That we choose not to be conformed because there's one or the other. We can be conformed to the world or we can be transformed by the renewing of our minds. The mind of Christ, Philippians 2 says, have this mind in you which was in Christ Jesus. Be very, very careful, sweet women of God, of the subtle process of the world influencing your life. It may not seem dramatic. It probably can be quite gradual. But it comes into our thoughts and it erodes our lives. We lower our standards. We begin to think worldly thoughts. And soon, the things of God become less appealing the things of the world more appealing. And after a while, we have no interest in the things of God at all. No reason to go to church, no call to prayer, no hunger for God's word. It is one or the other, there really is no middle ground. We can be conformed or transformed. You and I choose to pursue godly thoughts, to clean out our minds of things that do not please him. 
God knows your mind, he knows your needs, he knows your thoughts, he knows you need and I need transformation. The mind is the key to the Christian life. Our thinking must be changed, the lives of the world replaced with the truth of God's word. Fill your mind with it, read it, meditate on it, memorize it, sing it, study it more than ever before. It's time for us to get our faces out of Facebook and get our faces in this book. It is one or the other. Guard it, clean it, renew it with God's words. And then this final thought, and Connie, I can't see that clock you pointed out to me. Where did it go? <laughs> and what does it say, Connie? <laughs> and what, am I, what time am I supposed to be done? No, 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 really. What time am I supposed to be done? And it's 2 o'clock. It's 2.04. Okay, good. I have one more thing I wanted to. Think about this. His thoughts towards you outnumber all the sand and all the beaches and all the deserts and all of the earth. That's how much he's thinking about you. How often do you think about him? Set your mind on him. Set your mind on things above, not on the earth. Be lifted up in the heavenlies through your thoughts. Choose these things, things that are true and noble and just and pure and lovely and of good report. Choose these thoughts. It seems so simple. We all know this section of scripture. We all know these things. But how often do we actually sit down and say, okay, now I'm going to think about what's true. I'm going to think about what's noble. I'm going to think about what's just. If there is any virtue, if there is anything praiseworthy, we need to be meditating on those things. And as you do this, you will see a change. You will re experience a relief in your worry, a lift to your spirits, and you will be returned to your first love because you will be thinking about him. Take these words, take these lists, write it down somewhere today. Go home, sit in a chair, open up your Bible, and think on the things that Paul tells you.